No matter what you think about DNA profiling, businesses are lining up to buy in. Whether the new technology can help police solve criminal cases or influence your insurance premium, we're beginning to see it more and more. In this edition of Make, Create and Innovate, we find out how DNA sequencing is getting faster, how companies are paying big for it, and how it's beginning to save lives. billion base pairs in human DNA, we as individuals only differ genetically by 0.1%. This is no ordinary microchip. It's designed to detect those minute differences between us quickly, cheaply and efficiently. The promise, no less, is a revolution in medicine. My invention is really the ability to switch on and off a microchip with DNA. Going from something that's laboratory driven that would take weeks to sequence your DNA to a small microchip that could do it within 30 minutes to me was a revolution. Invented in 2001, Genalysis is a platform where a microchip can cross-reference a patient's DNA with a template for a particular mutation or genetic code. So you might be predisposed to type 1 diabetes, for example. So on this microchip, I've got the template of type 1 diabetes. So now this microchip is comparing your DNA with the target of type 1 diabetes. And within less than 30 minutes, I can determine whether or not you have that genetic predisposition. Dubbed Quick Read DNA, Genalysis is all about speed. It's those critical applications in triage situations, situations where you do need a real-time result. Wouldn't it be wonderful if they could give you the right drug, the right dosage at the right time? Personalizing medicine, as it were. And Chris Tumazu's interest in genetics first developed for a very personal reason. My son uh, got renal failure. When he was nine years old, uh, he lost his kidneys. This was a genetic predisposition. Had your invention existed earlier, would it have made any difference? It would have been managed very, very differently, because if we detected it early enough, it wouldn't have been preventative medicine, but we could have managed his lifestyle. Tumazu and his team are convinced their technology will change the face of future healthcare. But for now, their trials are more skin deep. Genalysis arrives on the High Street in London this summer. One unique retail outlet, New Bond Street, where else? But the purpose isn't medicinal, it's cosmetic. So this is your personalised DNA testing kit. Mm -hmm. We're going to be analysing two of the major causes of uh, skin ageing. Collagen levels and your antioxidant levels. In half an hour, we'll have your DNA ageing profile. We've licensed it to a company called GNU who actually use the technology to look at skin DNA and they can then recommend a bespoke cosmetic. Well we actually have the creams ready for you. So these are made specifically for me? It's bespoke for you. GNU doesn't come cheap. $500 a month or so for the bespoke creams. But the real ambition for this technology lies not with the beauty industry but in healthcare. It's an invention potentially worth billions to the big pharmaceutical companies. Genalysis has been licensed to Life Technologies, a company recently acquired by Thermo Fisher in the United States for $14 billion. Because I believe that the future doctor will be somebody that will be looking at your medical future and not your medical history. I'd like to invite Professor Chris to give the 25th Innovate. Lecture. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Jeff. Um, good afternoon, Your Royal Highness, uh, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's a great honour to give this uh, gavel lecture. Um, it's really exciting, actually. I, I feel like it's one of those audiences with, because I've got so many friends and family here as well. So thank you all all for coming to this lecture. Um, 
as the video showed, the, the sort of whole medical device industry has just been invigorated by the application of technology. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a time where the merge between engineering and medicine has been so strong. And we're, we, we're sort of entering this, this sort of wonderful uh, new lifestyle, this new wave of lifestyle inspired by sort of healthcare, well-being, quality of life. Um, more importantly, the whole molecular way, and that's personalization. And we, we, we all sort of love DNA. We all know about DNA. I mean, if I test you, like, uh, your Royal Highness, A is for anodine and C is for... Come on, you said you knew about this stuff earlier. Come on, Sister Seen, and T is for thymine and guanine. So, so that, that's, that's the double helix. So, so we all love DNA, but it's actually not the DNA that, that generally counts. It's the transcripted DNA, the DNA that's translated into proteins, into lifestyle, into what we're all about. And we sometimes ignore this messenger, this thing called the RNA. And this RNA just takes these traits, these genetic traits from our DNA and converts into what we are. So I thought we'd do justice to RNA and not just DNA. And the only difference between the two, as far as we're all concerned, is that thymine is converted into this other base called uracil. So T becomes a U. And that is really the start of protein synthesis. That's all it all, how it all begins. And I thought provocatively, therefore, I would call this title U plus life, because it is life. It's all about lifestyle. So U plus life the era of microchip technology, because I think that, you know, the microchip or the human body will be, actually it's beginning to be, the next new generation of the semiconductor industry. Now, you know, there's going to be many laws that I'm going to talk about when I go through this presentation, but there's one law that I have to mention now, which is Murphy's Law, because if something can go wrong, it will go wrong, and I'm going to do a, a few world's firsts, okay? Um, and the first world's first is that we are going to do a live demonstration of the DNA test. Now, it's not going to be for diabetes. It's not going to be for any vascular disease. It's actually going to be for skin DNA. Okay, you saw it on the, on the video earlier. So I needed a guinea pig, and I asked around, and guess who volunteered to do the test? Our president, Alice Gass. <laughs> so Alice, if you stand up. Um, I'm going to invite Dr. Maria Cavella, who's the retail principal scientist at GNU, and she's going to extract your DNA. She's going to show you how, how you should do that. And then the DNA is going to be extracted onto the microchip. The microchip's going to go into a, a little gateway that you see on the, on the podium here. And then the results, once they're established, will then be connected to a cloud. And the cloud will then send back the information and we'll know exactly Alice's skin DNA and we'll know exactly what serum that she needs to make her look even more younger than she is right now. <laughs> so, so, so that's the process. <laughs> so Maria's doing that. So Maria's going through the process now of lysing it and, and mixing the DNA from the cheek swab. And after a few seconds she'll put it into some more buffer solution. and put it onto the chip, yeah? And notice the chip is completely labless. It, it's, it's a microfluidic chip. Um, all the integration, all the technology, everything, the primers that you need to do the matching. For two of the genes, we're looking at two genes, we're looking at collagen degradation and antioxidant protection, which are major, major genes for skin ages, the aging. So Alice, you volunteered, so um, we're going to have to give you these results. And what's going to happen is that once Maria puts the chips into the gateway, we'll know that the results are, are, are finalized because the, the chips will pop out. Okay, so once the chips pop out, we'll have your results, and then I'll give you your results. And if you don't mind, I'll give them in public. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a recreational gene, so it's, it's, it's unregulated, so... so, so, it, so so it should be absolutely fine. 
So, so what, what, what was very interesting though, when I started reading up about Dennis Gabor, I, I, I read quite a bit of his early works where he saw the great link between life sciences and engineering. And, and I was quite fascinated and I found this wonderful quote in some of his early work that says, till now man has been up against nature, from now on he will be up against his own nature. That was very telling, he almost predicted the genomics wave because it's all about personalization. So I was really excited to find that, that quotation. So I feel that I'm amongst this sort of very privileged uh, scientific spirit that's in this, in this laboratory, in this lecture theater, because Dennis Gabble did teach here and he won his Nobel Prize um, in electrical engineering. But I'm a very humble engineer, so most of my work was sort of electronics and mobile phone technology. I spent most of my early days making low power radio chips for things like this. And, and I was very interested in the analog bit, not the digital bit. You know, today we graduate engineers with flat fingers and ones and zeros pouring out of their ears. We crush this beautiful physics, this interface to the analog world into this so-called coded or binary world. But actually, actually you'll see in a moment that my contention is that biology is actually analog. It's not digital. So my honeymoon in the medical area, which was about a year ago, as you see there, <laughs> was when a, when a company uh, in Canada approached me. This was several years ago. They developed this wonderful, wonderful uh, array, an electrode array for, the uh, for born deaf children. It was a cochlear prosthetic. And this array behaved very much like the proboscis of a butterfly. It was a spiral array, and the surgeon could insert it very, very easily, it would just spiral around and make physical contact to the eighth nerve in the ear, ear, in the ear. And that was fantastic, because it meant that the power consumption in the electrodes went down enormously. So what these poor children had was these neat electrodes implanted in the, in the head and outside, they had these whacking great digital processing chips trying to mimic the biology of the ear. And cosmetically, they looked awful. The children couldn't have baths or anything. So they approached me to see if I could take that whacking great digital processor and make a very low power chip that would, could, could be totally implanted in the inner ear. So we were able to do that. And after a few years, using this low-power technology, we modeled the way the basilar membrane works. I mean, the basilar membrane is a very, very thin fluid-filled tube. One end is quite flabby, and the other end is quite thick. And it's got 24,000 hair cells along its surface. So a high-frequency signal will cause the thick or flabby end to vibrate. I think I'm in the classroom with students here. A high frequency signal will cause a flabby or thick end. The high frequency signal causes the thick end to vibrate. A low frequency signal causes the flabby end to vibrate. So you effectively got a spectrum analyzer and a radio. And, and the hair cells are the mechanical to electrical transducers. We, we replaced all of that with a chip that mimicked that electrical radio behavior. And what was really exciting for me, and it was a turning point, is that we replaced 24,000 elec effective electrodes with just 16. And the brain took over. The brain had the plasticity and regeneration capabilities to give something so inaccurate hearing. And that was the start of the first implantable cochlear prosthetic. We licensed that to a company, and now more than 10,000 born deaf children can hear as a result of this cochlear prosthetic. So that was the sort of beginning, that was the journey into the area. And that's when I met Sir Richard Sykes, says Richard. And Richard, Richard was then the rector of Imperial College. And Richard and I worked together to create this institute because we realized then that it was at the interface between engineering, medicine, and life sciences where the ingredients are. That's the only way that you're going to create the cake. And we were just creating chefs that can make those mixtures. So Richard was really bullish in helping me to break some of the silos that you find in traditional universities so that we could create these biomedical um, devices. But there's one gentleman in the audience that really, really made it happen for us, uh, Professor Winston Wong. 
and I'll show him on the next slide. Uh, Win Winston Wong was key because Winston not only helped with funding, but he was also pivotal in adding some real intellectual knowledge into the institute. And we created this centre called the Centre of Bio-Inspired Technology. And it was really a centre that enabled us to use biology to inspire technology to replace the biology. And this was really the start of, of true medical device technology for us. So Winston, thank you very much and thank you also for helping us to save lives because if it wasn't for you, a lot of this work would not have happened. So thank you, Winston. So we shouldn't get too complacent. We have an epidemic on our hands right now. Um, this is not a healthcare problem. This is a consumer problem. Chronic disease is just on the up and up and up. More than 25 million people in the UK alone suffer from chronic disease. Diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease. And what's really saddening is this is, you know, we're all living longer. There are more over 65s than under 16s. So, you know, I go to the gym regularly. I see 65 year olds in the gym regularly. You know, lifestyle has changed enormously. But when you look at chronic disease management, particularly in a home setting, it looks pretty, pretty primitive. This is a state-of-the-art home system looking at some blood pressure monitoring. This is medical-grade technology, but not really consumer technology. So we've got to change that mould. I show this slide quite a lot because what, what I'm excited about is when I see this in the background, there's, there's another hand there. I don't know where it's come from. <laughs> And there's also, an, there's also an ashtray with a cigarette in it. So, so I just thought I'd show it because it intrigues me. I don't know where I got the slide from, but I noticed that, um, that difference. But, but the good news is that we are being invigorated by the application of medical sensors. We're seeing all these beautiful sensors now coming on the markets. I spot a lot of I, I, Apple watches amongst a, a number of you. We've got the Fitbits and all these sort of Nike, Nike technologies, which are good technologies, but they're not medical grade. They're well-being technologies. So there's a big disjoint now between medical grade technology and real, real consumer chronic disease management type technologies. So my contention is that we're doing it all wrong. So this is not digital health. This is analog health in a digital world. And we should get back to basics now, and we should start looking at interpretation of data in the way biology understands it, rather than just shipping out large amounts of data from sensors to a cloud, uninterpreted, and then deciphering it at the back end. It's just data overload, and it's non-intelligent, and it's not going to help with chronic disease management. So analog is sort of the wisdom. I, I think that, uh, you know, speech, sound, hearing, sight, uh, they're all analog signals. We don't see with 20 bits, we don't hear with 20 bits of precision, so they are analog signals. And the interest for me is how do we mimic that? Now look at this slide, I use it often, it's an old slide, you can see how often I use it with some of the characters on there, but spot the monkey. Now, I'm sure a number of you spotted that nut monkey instantaneously, okay? Well, the best digital computer on the planet could not spot that monkey instantaneously. No matter how much processing, the ability for the retina to store, ship, sense, and ship out information instantaneously is what makes us so, so fast and instantaneous. Yet, the brain of a common housefly, smaller than a grain of rice, could spot that monkey instantaneously. And that's just due to all the local processing that we have within our biology. Um, take the retina. The retina is a fantastic piece of neural wetware. It's the only part of the brain that sticks out of the head. And what happens, you've got all this high bandwidth information, unprocessed, coming into the retina via the light. It then gets compressed onto 100 million photoreceptors. All the processing is done locally with these ganglion cells and then all you've got is the interpreted information that goes to the brain. So why aren't we then doing all our sensors and biology in, in that way? Why have we sort of got struck just by the digital world? So we need to create things in the language of biology. So a tiny, tiny bit of physics and I'll move on to some healthcare, healthcare work. One of our big heroes in, in physics and electronics is a chap called Boltzmann who looked at the distribution of, of molecules in matter. 
And that distribution followed, we call it the energy distribution, Boltzmann's energy distribution, it followed an exponential. So remember exponentials from our log days and anti-log days. An exponential is, a, is an E. And this is exactly the same way as ionic current works in a semiconductor device. So the current in a device follows an exponential relationship with its voltage. Now what's intriguing is that in nervous tissue, chemical ions and electrical ions are also in a thermal equilibrium with their surroundings. So if I modulate nervous tissue with a voltage, for example, I'm still going to get this exponential ionic current. And a lot of this early work was established by other Nobel laureates such as Hodgkin and Huxley when they looked at nerve axon equations, potassium, sodium, calcium, ionic behaviour, all followed very similar to the behaviour of semiconductors. So a few years ago we identified this and we thought wouldn't it be great if we could marry the two things? We could start using the physics of the semiconductor to replicate the physics of the nervous system and start actually now creating prosthetics and monitoring devices out of microchips. And the two people that I wanted to bring together was the person on the right, who's Bolchman, and the person on the left, who's Nernst. Now Nernst looks at biochemical behaviour. We Most of us should know or have heard of the Nernst equation, which is the relationship between pH and hydrogen ion in biology or in chemistry, and that's logarithmic. So I started thinking, what would, wouldn't it be great if we put the exponential of the electrical device together with the log of the chemical device, and when you put a log and an exponential together, you linearize. So that's what I wanted to do. Imagine if we had interdisciplinarity hundreds of years ago. This is the sort of marriage we would have got, which meant that now I could linearize biochemistry out of semiconductor chips for the first time. So all of a sudden, I've got microchips that can actually mix between biochemistry and circuits and electricity all on one device. And we patented this idea many years ago and we called it using a transistor to linearize chemistry. So this was the birth of trying to create now out of microchips metabolic functions. I was able to create cochlear devices, retinal devices, islets for pancreas. Uh, beta cells, alpha cells, all these different devices now out of the mathematics that you can get out of mixing chemical and uh, electrical transistors together. We called our group the Biologically Inspired Electronics Group, the group that one of the first groups in the world where we are starting to mimic biology out of semiconductors. So I wanted to apply this in practice. So the very, very first device we created, we span out a company a few years ago from Imperial College, and we created this device called the Sensium. Not the Pentium, the Sensium. And the Sensium was really the processor of biology. We wanted to use this for physiological monitoring. I remember when Marcus, for example, was on dialysis at home, and his, his mother, Anne, and, and I, when he was having a, a test, maybe his blood pressure, his heart rate, or his temperature, we were paranoid. Is it right? Is it wrong? Trying to manage chronic disease in a home environment is really, really difficult. I wanted the big brother of monitoring. It would have been great if I had some sort of patch that sat on your chest, that could stick on your chest, and would give you medical grade information, all interpreted about your heart rate, your blood pressure, your temperature, and it would wirelessly transmit it. To, to the hospital so the doctor could be recording your information continuously and then if there was a vital sign or an issue then the uh, hospital would call an ambulance and you know then you know that you're safe and that stress is taken away from the carer. So we developed this device, it got FDA approved in 2011 it's only now starting to be pushed into hospitals. It's taken so long for the healthcare system to understand preventative medicine, but we're getting there. So here's a small little um, clip with one of the first hospitals in the U.S. that deployed this technology. It's crucial patients' vital signs are closely monitored. Well, now a new device is less intrusive and more thorough than ever before. Rich Demiro explains in today's Tech Report. Monitoring patients' vital signs is a time-consuming process, but a new device is making it easier and helping nurses to detect important changes faster than ever before. In a hospital, every second counts. 
Now, new technology is helping to monitor patients more thoroughly than ever before. Normally, vital signs are taken every four hours. This way, it's taken every couple minutes. And if there's a deterioration in the patient, the nurses are alerted immediately. The product is called Sensium Vitals, basically a bandage packed with electrodes and low-power wireless technology. It can detect changes in temperature, heart rate, and breathing. Information is instantly sent to a computer screen or mobile device. It's good for patients because it's a very lightweight, non-obtrusive way of monitoring the patients and it alerts nurses to subtle changes in the patient's condition. Donna Hendel is in charge of patient care at St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica, the first hospital in the U.S. to use the recently FDA-approved device. The results have been um, impressive. Shorter hospital stays, an average of six less days. Plus, since patients wearing the devices can avoid escalating medical issues, hospital bills can be cheaper too. I'm, I'm more or less unaware that they own. I, I don't think about something being attached to me. It's very comfortable. I like it and I feel that it's doing what it is supposed to do about my vital signs. Each disposable patch has a battery that lasts about three days. The real magic is that patients can potentially wear the patch after being discharged, which means hospital-like monitoring in the comfort of home. This technology shows a lot of promise, especially if doctors can catch an issue before it spirals out of control. If you'd like to learn more, just go to thetechreport.tv. I'm Rich DeMiro. That's your Tech Report. Uh, sorry about that. Well, thing. Kate. Uh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> so this clip here, he said the magic was out of the hospital into the home. So this is the first time ever that we're using this patch out of the hospital but into a lecture theatre. So I patched up, or the, the nurses patched up Marcus. This is Marcus at uh, the Churchill Hospital in, in Oxford. He's on dialysis four times a week, so he's still looking for a kidney. But today he's here and he's got the patch on. So he's come out of the hospital. And before I get on to uh, Marcus uh, real time tonight, um, Alison Burdett, who's the chief technology officer who did a PhD with me many years ago is monitoring him in the hospital environment and you'll see um, here are his vital signs in the hospital this is we're looking at and this is all medical grade just like an ECG monitor but without an ECG monitor so the top curve is his um, heart rate second is his respiration and third is his temperature what you can see at the top his heart rate is pretty stable. It's pretty stable because he's on beta blockers, so you can't see much difference. But towards the end of the session, the heart rate starts to rise as he's coming off dialysis. Now, that indicator, as a parent, if I was in a home environment and I looked at his heart rate, I would panic. I wouldn't know what was going on. But now they've got the trends, and that is just relayed back to the hospital data set. So the GP or clinician can look at that information and know if it's an anomaly or if there's something to worry about. So Marcus is here tonight. So Marcus, if you want to just stand up and show us the patch, here's Marcus. And, and um, Alison is monitoring him. She's been monitoring him on the screen. Uh, for, so he's still wearing the patch from yesterday. And uh, I don't know what the results are looking like. How are you doing? Are you all right? Yes. <laughs> so that's the patch. And this is real-time recording now. It's every few seconds, so you won't see it moving. But you'll see over the course of the rest of the lecture. I think there was a blip there because he walked up the stairs, you said. This was at 10 past 5. Uh, but then it's gone back to normal again. So you, you're doing well, Marcus. So you hang in there. <laughs> so, so this just demonstrates that now Marcus can go about his daily life and wear that patch. And he can be monitored 24-7 anywhere around the world. He could have Magdi Yaqub. Uh, in Egypt, looking at his heart rate. Um, the only thing is that the clinician needs to know how to use technology. That's the important thing. <laughs> I, I remember actually when the Queen opened the Institute and I gave a demonstration of the patch and it wasn't working as well. And Magdi was in the audience and Magdi was next to the Queen. And my heart was obviously all over the place, you know, having to give a talk in front of the Queen. And I said to Magdi, how am I doing? How am I doing? And he had the device with him and he was going, I said, Magdi, he said, I don't know, I don't know how to put this on. <laughs> and then that sort of typified, you know, engineering and medicine, you know. <laughs>
But um, let's move on to uh, going from monitoring now to therapy. Diabetes, as we know, has become epidemic through obesity and other diseases, particularly type 2. It's hugely on the rise through lifestyle. I'm shocked at, at I would call kids now taking insulin being type 2 diabetic because they're becoming type 2 at the age of 20. So that by the time they're 35, they're insulin dependent. That's just due to lifestyle and obesity. And some of the statistics are just awful. Imperial College did a study with Harvard saying it's doubling nearly every year. So what we wanted to create was an artificial pancreas. Uh, why not? You know, we've got the technology, we've got the understanding. Why don't we work and try and create a microchip that could actually mimic the way the beta cells and alpha cells, the islets, work so that we could secrete insulin and glucagon continuously. A lot of this work was led by Dr. Pantelis Georgiou in the audience with, with his team, and we created an artificial pancreas. Now, I just want to show you this, just as a, as a sort of um, slide, which really shows that still we're in the primitive age, because this is one of the first kids that ever had insulin. On the left, he was diagnosed as diabetic, on the right, he's been given insulin, and look how healthy that child looks. And this was, you know, back in 1913. Um, very healthy, but what you don't realize is that child's got no legs. And he's lost his legs through hyperglycemia, because the insulin is not con secreted continuously in the way biology secretes it. And if you don't have it, you just take one spot measurement of insulin, then effectively you go and eat and do some exercise, your levels are all over the place, and those hyper effects means you get retinopathy, you lose your sight, you lose your limbs, and all these other side effects. And when you look at where we are, this was the first diabetes syringe, uh, an insulin, 90th, the Wellcome Centre actually, you can see that in the, in the Wellcome Library on the left, and on the right is 2015. What's different? Nothing but the packaging. And I don't even know if it's up to Ron Dennis's standards, <laughs> but that is the packaging that we, that, that, that we have. So, you know, we need a drastic change in the way we evolve this, this field. And I think technology, such as the technology I want to describe to you now, is going to have major impact, I think. So what we want is something that's non-obtrusive, that can mimic the way the pancreas works, can sit on the peritoneum, and it can, can secrete insulin continuously. And so, these are the side effects which I don't really want to go through. But so we took the pancreas, we took the islets, we looked at the spike in behaviour, and out of those electrical uh, chemical uh, chips, microchips, we were able to mimic exactly the way the beta and alpha cells work. And that provides the intelligence now to a small little pump that can sit on the peritoneum and can sec secrete insulin continuously with, without the patient having to take blood and secrete insulin. And these are the chips and circuits we use. That's the size of very, very small, just a few millimeters of the microchip. It fits inside a small peritoneum pump. The pump and the, and the sensor sit onto the peritoneal cavity here. And wirelessly, you can see the transmission of glucose, being, insulin being secreted within the body. So the tests have been taking place now for almost two years at the Hammersmith Hospital. Um, this is the world's first closed-loop bio-inspired artificial pancreas between Des Johnson, Nick Oliver, and, and our group here at, at Imperial College. Um, whoops. Let me go back to this. Murphy, Murphy. He, he looks a bit like Murphy. <laughs> Sorry, we'll get that back. Yeah, so, so we've been doing these trials now for, t for two years on a number of patients. It's mainly to make sure that the closed-loop behaviour ensures that the glucose, the insulin levels, are continuously um, secreted. Maybe we can go with Mohammed until we resolve this. Yeah. Okay. Alright. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Mohammed. So, 55 closed loop studies already, human studies. This is the second year. And um, on Friday, uh, I spoke to Dr. Pantelis. They did the very, very first bihormal, stu bi bihormal study. 
So that means that your horm two hormones are being secreted now. One is insulin and the other is glucagon. Glucagon helps with hypoglycemia, the baddie that gives you all the comas. You've got to make sure that you're within the hypoglycemia range and the hyper range. So it's a, it's a balancing act between the two. So this is the very, very first study. And we're fortunate to have actually the first patient that was on this clinical trial who is wearing the closed loop system today with us. In fact, he's with us because he's actually doing his PhD with Dr. Pantelis. So Mohammed, do you want to come up down on the stage? So Mohammed has actually got the closed loop system that he's been using now throughout the day. He's wearing it on him and these are his results. So yeah. do, you, do you want to show us the... Uh... So I'm wearing the sensor which is measuring my sugar every five minutes. And that's what you see here is the insulin values being uh, proposed by the algorithm. And it's, and it's continuously within that range. So yeah. you've got this 24-7, basically. Yeah, exactly. You want yeah. to stay in target as, as long as you can. Yeah. yeah. So there's no need to take the glucose, no need to inject the insulin. And, and how does it feel? How do you... Well, you don't get a holiday with diabetes, but now with the system on, you really take a break from it and the decisions you have to take. So, no, it's quite good. It's Mohammed, thank you so much for doing everything for us. It's sure. really kind. Okay, thank you. So, so, you know, it's technology like this that really manages your lifestyle, that, that, that makes a dramatic, a dramatic change on, on the way um, healthcare is now going to be administered. So, one project that Professor Wong and I got interested in uh, a couple of years ago was, well, look, you know, in the same way as I remember Magda Yacoub, had this Yakub recovery technique for artificial hearts. He would put in an artificial heart in a patient, it would relax pulmonary pressure, and the natural heart would recover, because he was re relaxing the, the, the dying heart. So we started thinking, well, why not beta cell rejuvenation? If the beta cells are starting to die, could we not relax them somehow by giving insulin so that they can be recovered? And we started studying in this field, and we found that there was a study in Asia where people that were just on the cusp of type 2 were actually given insulin for four weeks. And in those four weeks, 50% of those cases saw recovery of beta cells, and actually 60 to 97% of the, of the beta cells in that 50% recovered. Which means that once you've got to recovery, then all you need to do is change your lifestyle to make sure that you stay in that normal range. But what's really exciting is that 50% is not good enough. So Professor Wong has agreed to do the largest Asian study in the world on beta cell rejuvenation for type 2s. He's going to be looking at a study at the National Taiwan University <coughs> in Taiwan. We're going to look at a huge cohort of type 2 diabetics. And we're going to look at using this closed-loop uh, bio-inspired pancreas to give this, them this first infusion to see if we can recover and if you like cure type 2 diabetes. So thank you Winston for, for supporting that. And, um, and so the exit is really a healthy lifestyle and that's really what, what it's all about. So the, the last but most important subject for me is early detection. It's not just about making sick people better and unhealthy people healthy, but also healthy people healthier. So from early detection right through to therapy. So we mentioned the genome wave. Um, you know, we've got three billion bases. We all differ by 0.1%. It's those mutations that determine whether or not we can metabolize things differently, whether we are predisposed to genetic diseases, etc., etc. And my big introduction into this field was through two sources. One was through, through Marcus. I was desperate to find a way that we could sort of screen even babies to see if they've got these genetic disorders earlier rather than later. And secondly, I was inspired by these two, two gentlemen. Um, I met Dr. Taksim Sinawatra uh, around 2003, two and three, when he was then the Prime Minister. He was also running uh, the largest mobile phone network in, in Thailand, so we were working together in the, in the cellular area. But lo and behold, his scientific advisor was Craig Venter. And Craig Venter, as we all know, was the guy that invented the first sequencing machine. He did the first genome. He stood on the stage with Clinton and he said, wow, you know, we spent two or three billion dollars and we sequenced the first human genome. 
So uh, Dr. Taksim introduced me to Craig, and we got on really, really well. He saw what I was doing as almost the Intel inside, and he was the Microsoft. He, he was all about the software and synthetic biology, and I was about the microchips. So we got on really, really well. Um, I, I came back. We were working in this field. You know, we invented this whole area of semiconductor sequencing. This was the eureka moment when I had a, a medical student, and I asked the student, instead of putting electricity on the microchip, what happens if you put DNA on the microchip? And the microchip turned on. And that was really the birth of semiconductor sequencing. And today, every other sequencing machine now that you find in all major hospitals are using this technology we invented. So we can sequence full genomes. This chip, for example, which comes from DNA Electronics, the company I founded, this one chip can sequence five full genomes in a couple of hours. Five genomes on, on a small microchip this size. But I was more intrigued about miniaturization and not having central labs, but bringing, bringing the whole sequencing technology to, to the patient, where the real need is, the point of, of care, the real test. We even sequence this man's genome with this technology. And this man, some of you recognize him, Crick from, uh, no he's not, he's Watson, just testing. <laughs> James Watson, a Nobel Prize winner, the Crick and Watson double helix. I'm not going to tell you about his DNA, by the way. <laughs> so we'll move on just to show that, that all I wanted to do was miniaturize this whole thing. So instead of having it in a big lab setting, I just wanted a handheld device, something as small as this, that would actually look at a single chip and we can do a test. So some of the first work we did was with companies like Glaxo and Pfizer for drug metabolism. So important. Look at how many people uh, get ineffective drugs. You know, sorry Richard, but Big Pharma needs to start going towards person. I know you've retired from Glaxo, so that's fine. But, 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 but Big Pharma really do need to personalize medicine. You either overdose or underdose. More people are dying from over and underdose than they are from, you know, the, the, the illness they started off with. It's, it's just completely wrong. So we started doing tests, making sure that with a SNP, or if you like, a primer on this, say for warfarin, a blood thinning drug, we could do within 15 minutes, we could do a, a quick test and we can determine whether or not you can metabolize that drug or not. So the doctor would then give you the right prescription. So for me, this was a really, really important move. But where I'm really taking this technology, where I think the desperate need is, is in the next field. Because Whilst this lecture is continuing, two women will die of breast cancer who think they're in remission. And the reason they'll die from breast cancer is because they're given the wrong drugs. And they don't know that they've been given the wrong drugs because these mutations, we have estrogen uh, receptor mutations in our body, well, we, I don't, but women will. And what happens with these mutations is that they start now to mutate and sometimes if you look in the micro environment you've got all these mutations starting to come from these cancer cells and as the tumor grows these mutations spread and you don't know that you've got these mutations that become resistant then to say endocrine therapy and all the different therapies that we need so we're working very closely with the head of breast cancer at the Hammersmith Charles Coombs who's basically been looking at endocrine resistance and looking at effectively this receptor, which is the estrogen receptor, which, which is, you know, estrogen, as you know, is the hormone that causes this gene. If you've got this, your cancer starts to uh, uh, sort of grow. And if you look at metastasis over time, the bigger the tumor becomes, the harder it is. Now, how does, an, how does a lady know? She'll go to the GP, the GP is not going to do a biopsy. Why would he do a biopsy? And also, it's fatigue, it's very expensive. Uh, a CT scan, expensive. An MRI, expensive. So the regular checks when a lady's in remission will not indicate this unless you go through these exhaustive procedures. So serendipitously, is that the right word, Charles Coombs was working independently of us at the Hammersmith Hospital. And he was using this machine called the Iron Torrent machine, which uses our semiconductor technology. And I met with Charles, and this is what's fascinating. Apparently, see, that you don't need a biopsy 
to get hold of some of the, 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 the DNA of the tumour. There's this free-floating DNA that floats from the tumour in your blood or in plasma. And this free-floating DNA, there's only small fragments of it when the tumour starts to mistake or grow again. There's only small fragments of it. But if you had a sensitive DNA sequencing technology that could actually within in this particular case with less than one percent of recovered uh, circulating free tumor DNA they were able to detect and sequence those uh, genes those those mutations they realized in a number of patients that those mutations were resistant to the estrogen gene so you can imagine they caught but this was a clinical trial and that's why they caught this but if this wasn't a clinical trial you wouldn't catch it this this lady, for example, here, um, she was 16 years in remission, 16 years, and she was part of this clinical trial. And she then, with a simple blood test now, not a mammogram, not a biopsy, a simple blood test, they were able to, using our technology, our DNA technology, they were able to determine the mutation in that gene. They saw that that mutation was resistant, to the particular estrogen drug, and now they're giving her the right therapy. So this lady will live. Now, how do you do that in routine? How do you do that in routine? The only way you'll do it is if you had a cheap blood or saliva test, something like a, a pregnancy test. So during the remission, you can just go and buy this technology and try it out. So we have to beautify and simplify medical technology. We can't have it as this crude, very, very hardcore technology that you find in hospitals. We need it in the sort of setting where an individual can just go, they can do the test, and they can check whether or not their cancer is starting to metastasize. So we really need you know, the right therapy at the right time, all on cue. And to do that, that's when we had the vision of Gene U. See, for me, Gene U is not really about cosmetics. It's a, there's a big business around cosmetics, and that's fantastic. But it's, for me, it's all about taking the stigma away from medical technology, bringing medical technology into a retail environment. Because if you can then beautify it, then you can use vanity for healthcare. Let's push that. Let's take that stigma away. And so using the microchip for a recreational test, and did I hear something there? Yes, that means your test is up there, your results are ready. So let me get to the point of your results. So this is the setting we set up in Bond Street, very friendly, very luxurious, very, very high end. Um, they've, we've appeared in a number of magazines, the unlikely lads. So Nick Rhodes has been the creative director, really trying to help and... Uh, take the, uh, if you like, this being great, he's, he's brought this sort of fashion to it, but he's also got it quite, quite, quite medical. And we were in the New York Times just a couple of days ago. It says, as personal as it gets. That is about DNA testing, by the way. That's not Nick and I, okay? It doesn't read right there, okay? It does look like I'm all, I'm all, it does look I'm all snug next to him there. I don't mean to be that snug. And, and the settings are amazing. We've got pods that you go into, a bit like the Star Trek type pods. And you can take these pods anywhere in the world. You don't need a shop in Bond Street. They can be anywhere and you can do these sorts of tests. And you saw Maria do the test earlier on, on, on Alice. Um, the packaging is fantastic. Um, Ron, I remember, came to visit our lab uh, a few months. No, it wasn't a few months, about six months ago. And he told me, off. he said, first polish your shoes, Chris. He said, then mop up. You don't want that. Your packaging needs improving. So we spent a lot of time improving, Ron, on the packaging. And I'm pleased to say we won the Luxury Packaging of the Year Award 2014. And here's Winston accepting the award um, with us. Um, I think it was an event somewhere in, in uh, I forget where we, were, where we received that award. Anyway, the Millennium Hotel. But anyway, that was the award for, for, for Luxury Packaging. So Alice, we're going to look at your results now. This is how your results are going to be portrayed, we're going to have circles. One is for collagen breakdown and the other one is for antioxidant protection. So if you get a full circle in both of them, it means that you're fantastic at protecting yourself from free radicals. And this one means that you're a very, very low degrader of collagen. So let's hope, let's hope that you've got two full circles, because if you have, you're amazing. So where are we going to see the results? Are you going to show them on the screen? 
Okay. Okay. So here are your results, Alice. So do you want to explain them, Maria, or shall, shall I explain them? Okay. Well, the good news is that you've got a complete full circle with antioxidants. So that means that your antioxidant gene is such that you are great at repelling free radicals. You're good at antioxidant protection. So you must have a great lifestyle in terms of protecting yourself from free radicals. So that's really, really good news. And that's quite unusual to have a, have a full circle, which is great. This one is not full, <laughs> so which is the aging one, the collagen degradation, but it's not bad. I mean, it's not, it's not sort of, this is the average. We would call this a heterozygous. You're either, to use the proper terms, you're either a mutant, which you're not. You're not a wild type either, because if you're a wild type, it would be the other way around. So you're a heterozygous, which is, which is in between. So, so congratulations, and we'll give you some free products afterwards. <laughs> So, so, so this is great. So, so this, this is the sort of information now. But what's important is that the information has been interpreted. A lot of these tests where you send your saliva off to a lab, and you have to wait weeks, they send you all this information about your genome. Nobody understands it and it's not interpreted. So interpretation is very, very important. So moving to uh, some of the final slides here. Going from beauty now to the beast. See, when the man-made diseases, the cancers and the AIDS and all these other things don't kill you, the things that are going to kill you are the bugs, the real bugs. Hospital-acquired infection and antimicrobial resistance. This has truly, truly, truly become ep epidemic. 50% of people that die in hospital die from sepsis and not from the disease they actually went into hospital to die from. They've died early from sepsis because it's just really, really, all these bugs are just coming out of the woodwork. I mean, Richard's the expert in this area, but it's just, they're mutating all these resistance genes. And, uh, you know, Cameron and Obama are really, really pushing this. You know, and the problem is the technology again. It's still Louis Pasteur days. It's still culture, you know, you go into a hospital, you have a blood test, you then do the whole plate stuff, you wait three days for a culture to see that bacteria grow, and only then do you know whether or not that the, the bugs that you've got are resistance to that gene. But when you go into the hospital, you're just bombarded with a broad spectrum antibiotic. That might kill the good guys, which is great, but that one bad guy that stays, then it mutates, <laughs> it mutates. And that's it. You know, it's rigor mortis within a few hours. It's really, really that bad. Every 6%, the risk of death goes up 6% every hour. It's the biggest killer. If you put breast cancer, if you put prostate cancer and AIDS together, sepsis and infectious disease is bigger than all those together. So we've been making microchips with big panels because now, I'm not interested in sequencing the human, I'm interested in sequencing the bug. Because if I sequence the bug, then I can look for the resistance gene really, really quickly. And then I can give the right antibiotic. So we want to now bring molecular medicine to the bug, not to the patient. And that's starting now to get real traction. We're looking at these chips now, but the primers that we're going to put on these chips are the primers for the pathogens and the DNA of those pathogens, because now we're able to sort of sequence a whole panel and determine the richness of information that we need to determine the right drug at the right time to avoid um, septic shock or, or, or sepsis. And this is the technology that, that, that we're looking at. So out of a central lab again and into the hospital environment. Now the very last topic, and I promise I'm going to shut up after this, um, is, is a subject that's really been fascinating us for, for, for several years, and that's the whole field of, of neural monitoring. Um, this young man that you see on the podium, uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Jofali is, is with us. Ah, there he is. Uh, um, he came to me, he was introduced to me again by Dr. Taksim several years ago, and he came to me and said, just out of the blue, uh, Chris, I want to do a PhD. I want to spend four years of my life in your labs and I'm fascinated by the brain. I really want to understand neurology. 
And, he, you know, Walid is one of these chaps that really looks after himself. He's really passionate about personalised medicine. He has a blood test, I think, nearly every other day. And he used to say to me, Chris, why are we? Why, why, when they measure my blood levels, they compare it against a standard. But surely that standard shouldn't be for everybody. Why aren't they comparing the blood levels against my own standard? Why aren't they comparing it against my own DNA? The same with the brain. You know, when we're measuring people's ECG signals, everybody's ECG, or they, we will all have different anomalies, as he's called it, because we've all got different genetics. So his thesis was on neural anomalies, um, really trying to understand how we can predict the behavior of the brain. So that got me fascinated in the link, in a very in important subject, the link between the brain and the gut. And now this nerve, called the vagus nerve, it's, in Latin it's known as the wandering nerve. It's a nerve that's had very, very little attention, but it's a fascinating nerve. It connects the brain to the periphery. Okay, it goes to the stomach, to the lungs, to the heart. It's a wonderful, wonderful nerve. And I realized after reading about it that a number of people have applied it for stimulation of epilepsy, depression, by having a little neural stimulator on the end of the vagus nerve and sending electrical shots to the brain to counter epileptic seizures. So I thought to myself, well, why don't I apply it to, a, to the other epidemic, the epidemic that connects the gut to the brain, called obesity. Because, if you remember as a kid, well I do, I used to hate school dinners. And I always used to get stressed by hating school dinners, and I got stomach problems when I hated school. So there's my automatic link from the brain to the gut. It's via that vagus nerve. And look at the problem. One in three adults are obese. One in three children are obese or overweight today. And we all, we all know the causes. And there aren't any drugs. There aren't any drugs. It's crazy. Nothing, uh, we have a professor here called Steve Bloom who's trying, but we're not quite, we're not quite there. Um, and we've seen these approaches, you know, hundreds of years of medical progress, and all you can tell me to do is eat less. <laughs> and you see the odd treadmill. I see loads of people like that on treadmills. So, so that hasn't actually solved the problem. Um, and it's getting worse. Well, biatric surgery and stomach stapling, that's a solution, but still the mortality is not that great and there's all these side effects, so it's still unproven technology. Um, so we decided to look at this link between the vagus nerve and, whoops, and the gut. Because what's really fascinating here is that through the afferent part of the vagus nerve, the part of the vagus nerve that, that's connected to the gut, you've got all these hormones. You've got the satiety hormone, which is, if you like, the appetite hormone, and you've got the ghrelin hormone that's telling the brain that you're hungry. So if we, could, if we could then measure, using my chips, the chemical behavior that goes through the vagus nerve, through this peripheral nerve, and then if the hunger hormone starts to be released, we'll send a signal to the brain to say to the brain, you're full. So actually using the sensor to monitor the chemical reactions that are taking place through the vagus nerve. So making the sensors intelligent to monitor those hormones. And up until now, that's never happened because people haven't had chemical sensors. All they've been doing is sending unintelligent neural signals to the brain. I mentioned the epilepsy situation. Here are the sort of electrodes that people use. There's a company called Cyberonics who have done over 60,000 patients now where they just send unintelligent stimuli to the brain trying to counter a seizure. If they had intelligence, then they stimulate only when they need to, not all the time. So instead of having a cuff electrode that's unintelligent by the brain, we wanted to put a cuff electrode that's very intelligent with all our chemical sensors right down by the gut. The sensors are using the chemical reactions. We want to measure pH, sodium, potassium, and calcium that travels through the gut to the brain. And with those patterns, we'll send an electrical signal now to tell the brain that you're hungry if you're, sorry, you're full <laughs> if you're hungry. Um, whoops, here we go again. So last slide and then we'll... Um
So, so this, is, this is the first time this has ever been done, not this, this is the first time this has ever been done. We've been working with Professor Steve Bloom at the Hammersmith. We've tested over three to 400 rodents so far. We want to go into humans in the next year. And the idea is that, that we want to now just have these very small sensors that we've created, look at the chemical reaction, and then make sure that we've got a pattern that recognizes that chemical reaction, because if it's the grayling pattern, then we send an opposite signal to the brain. And uh, I'm going to show you the world's first ever results. Um, so the, the device we used, by the way, we called the cuff electrode a binge device. <laughs> it's a bio-inspired neural gut expert. <laughs> that, that's the <laughs> so it replicates satiety, it replicates uh, appetite. And this is it. This is, I only reported it very briefly at Walid's brain forum, when Walid uh, opened up the brain foreman, uh, forum in Lausanne. But this is showing, for the first time, a huge change in the pH activity when a hormone, this is the CCK hormone, when an appetite hormone is released. Now, we would never have been able to see this ever before. The reason being that most of the technology that we've got to date in any lab only can measure electrical changes. And if you're trying to measure electrical changes, muscle movement causes a lot of noise. So you're not going to see any signals. It's hidden, absolutely hidden. But when you measure chemistry, you don't have noise. So therefore, you can see chemistry very, very clearly. So these are the very, very first results now to demonstrate that we're getting huge changes in pH as a result of changing the satiety or changing the hormone in the gut that, that then goes to the brain. So we're very, very excited uh, about, about this work because we've opened up now a, a field of exploration that's never, ever been looked at before. And in fact, this is not new because if you look at this, this young man here, he, he drew this nerve many, many years ago, but nobody had actually studied it. And, and he, he, in some of his writings, he was saying, well, this is a very complex nerve, you know, very complex. I know it connects to the heart and the gut, but nobody had actually taken much notice of it. So we, for the first time, are really looking at this big, big time. And I'm trying to coin a new field called vagomics, which is the vagus nerve with omics, because I think all of that is going to be about early detection, and it's marrying the two fields together. And, you know, as we move on, you've seen vagomics, but everything I've talked about so far has always been about this is the gene that you're born with, this is your genetics. There's so much evidence today now that those genes actually can switch on and off and express themselves through lifestyle, and that's known as epigenetics. So switching on and off genes from lifestyle is very different from the hereditary genes that we've created. So, and we've done some chips and tests on what we call DNA methylation, which is actually me measuring those changes in lifestyle genes. So the reason I've called this U plus life, it's not just about you and your acyl, it's actually how lifestyle also affects your genes and your makeup. And there's this wonderful quote from John Locke that says, new opinions are always suspected and usually opposed without any other reason but because they are not already common. So I'm hoping that now what I'm doing will be common. Wouldn't it have been wonderful if Boltzmann had a computer, eh? God knows what we would have created. So thank you all very much. Thank you.